Hey everyone, today we are chatting with Jess Turton uh, and Jess is a dietitian and I came across her work kind of through Dr. Pran on social media and also during this week Jess put up this awesome kind of like meme or graphic that was comparing the nutritional value of chickpeas to red meat and it was just like so starkly obvious and powerful and just really well kind of put together and I thought oh, I better reach out to Jess now um, and let's chat because she gets it. She knows what she's talking about and she can actually most likely articulate it better than I can. Um, so welcome, Jess. Thank you for having me. And I'm glad you liked my post. <laughs> that was great. It was really good. Yeah, I think, as you know, it just has a thousand words and that, yeah, chickpea versus red, red meat um, really connected. Yeah, there's so much dogma in nutrition about like, what are the right recommendations? But when you actually just look at the nutrient content of food and like, that's all you look at, mm. it can actually show so much. And like, it can become really obvious and logical to people as to what they should eat. Totally. Yeah. It's a much more objective way of having a conversation of like, okay, let's be honest, like meat and vegetables, they're both food. But if we assess them on a nutrient density or nutrient quality perspective, like, which one would you rather put in your body? And, you know, if one of them has some side effects as well, like bloating or gut damage, um, you know, then you can make a, you can put your health first and you can make a more you know, objective decision. So I would yeah. really like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, there's so much misinformation, isn't there? So we just bring it back to what we do know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Some kind of point of truth. Um, Jess, could you tell us all a little bit, a little bit about what you do? Yep. So as you said, I'm a dietitian and a nutritionist. So I practice um, in the private practice setting, both mm -hmm. online and in person. And I manage a small team of dietitians at Ellipse Health. And we also work closely with Dr. Pran Yoganathan at the Centre for Gastrointestinal Health, who you've um, interviewed as well. And we work with um, all clinical populations. So people who might want to lose weight, people who want to improve their gut health, people who have diabetes and want to improve the management of that or even reverse their diabetes if they have type 2 diabetes. Um, we work with people that have like PCOS, osteoporosis, disordered eating. And really our approach is just about looking at people's physiology, giving a really complex health assessment and treating everyone on an individualized basis to kind of find out what are their top nutritional priorities. So what are stopping these people from reaching their health goals? And then how can we develop a diet addressing that? And we really don't go into it with any sort of diet labels or anything like that. Like, for example, if we've got a patient who's low in iron and mm. one of their goals is to improve their energy levels and lose weight, then one of their nutritional priorities is going to be increasing their intake of iron. So we're very targeted in our approach. And I guess as well, I'm doing a PhD at the University of Sydney. So I kind of spend half my life in clinical practice seeing patients, which I love. It's great. And the other half of my life doing research and I've sort of coming to the end of my PhD now I'm in the middle of a clinical trial and we're investigating low-carb diets for type 1 diabetes management oh yeah that'd be interesting to see to see the results of that yeah um yes, so. have, yeah have you always been involved in nutrition and dietetics um yeah so like ever since you know we had that first class at school like a careers class and you were looking through what university degree you might do mm -hmm. and what ATAR or grade you had to get to get into that course like as soon as I saw the word nutrition I was like I'm doing that one <laughs> and so I guess I've had a pull towards diet and nutrition for a very long time and yes I just like made it a goal I'm like yep I'm gonna get in that degree it was quite a high ATAR that I had to reach, but I was just like super committed and super motivated. And I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. And um, one thing my dad said to me when I was really young, and it's just like fully stuck in my head. He said, um, if you enjoy what you do, you never have to work a day in your life. And I was like, that is nutrition. Like that's nutrition, that's diet. Like when I talk about that with people, it kind of lights me up 
and I can see people regaining control of their health and making improvements in their health and achieving food freedom. So yeah, it's what I've always wanted to do. And ever since I finished school, it's what I've been doing. Wow, it's so rare to know exactly what you want to do from such a young age. I suppose like you you knew you wanted to work in nutrition and food, but uh, has your philosophy or your understanding of how nutrition and how food works, has that evolved over time? Oh, definitely. And I think if you said no, then you wouldn't be a good nutritionist or dietitian because like the science is constantly evolving and there is just so much research. So you know, you're always going to be digging through it and you should be, you know, we should never just say, yep, I know the way to eat and that's it. I'm not going to look at any research again. We should always be questioning, like, what is the best approach based on individual circumstances and health conditions and so on. And so, yeah, definitely my approach has probably changed. Mm. I think, um, you know, when I was a lot younger, before I'd even gone to uni, I definitely grew up in a household who, We were trying to be healthy, but it was kind of like the standard healthy. So it was like, don't eat too much, um, low fat. We never got red meat, (laughs) never. And I'm so upset about it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, maybe like once a week or something, but it was kind of just like, you know, red meat is bad. So we didn't really get much of that. And so it was kind of like your typical healthy, low fat, low meat kind of diet. And um, then when I went to uni and I started looking at the research and I started looking at how the body actually functions because my undergrad degree was exercise and sports science. So it was a very like science-based degree. There wasn't a lot of nutrition dogma in there. So it allowed me to really just focus on how the body worked and what sort of fuels the body used. And that kind of led me into a lot of the science looking at low carbohydrate diets. Um, And then I kind of like dove into that personally. Um, And also my dad actually had a heart attack between my bachelor degree and my master's degree. And he was diagnosed with type two diabetes. So I kind of started looking into the research on, well, how can I help my dad? He's got type two diabetes. Like how can we, you know, improve his health? And low carbohydrate diets were just shown to be the most effective. So I guess like early on, I kind of questioned my original thinking, like an upbringing, I guess, when it comes to nutrition. And then I think that initial questioning just leads me to keep questioning, I suppose. And that's why I'm doing a PhD, because all good researchers should be constantly questioning and testing their hypotheses. They should be, but I don't think most are. I know, unfortunately. All good <laughs> researchers, I said. <laughs> yeah, totally. So did you have any success with your dad? Were you able to help him with his type 2 diabetes? My dad's going to listen to this and he's going to be like, oh, Jess, stop talking about it. Yeah, I'm very curious. <laughs> I'm always throwing him under the bus. Um, no, yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is, when you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and my dad was so lucky in a way because, like, he got the heart attack first and usually it goes the other way around. Like you find out you've got this diagnosis of type two and then it's like five, 10 years later, you're probably going to get a heart attack. It's just going to get progressively worse. Um, but I guess my dad's diabetes didn't really get picked up and that's a whole other story, you know, cause he was going to the doctor. He was sort of telling his doctor he's concerned. He thinks there's something, you know, wrong. He thinks he has diabetes, but his doctor just really didn't pick it up until he was in hospital and I'm pretty sure his blood sugars were like through the roof. Um, But yeah, my, my dad's pretty logical and like, he definitely listens to me and he could probably be a really good dietitian. Like that's how much he knows now. Wow. (laughs) And yeah, like, you know, when you get diagnosed with type two diabetes and when you've had 50, 60 years of habits ingrained into you, it's not easy to change those things. Like, it's not like suddenly it's just like, oh yeah, I'll stop eating carbs and then my life will be good. Um, It's still hard. Like it's still a challenge, but I would say that he's like constantly aware and he's constantly improving. And that's the most important thing because if you have type two diabetes and you're not given the right tools and you don't know how to improve or you don't even know that you can improve, it's going to get progressively worse. And your blood sugars are just going to go up and up and up. But he's been able to, at the very least, maintain his blood sugar control, maintain his weight and things like that. 
and prevent that progression. So I think that is a really good step. Yeah, that sounds like a win. Well, he's lucky to have you, lucky to have you there as a daughter to explain it all to him. Yeah. All right. So now in your in your practice, you're working both uh, in like clinical kind of professional, well, it's all professional, but a clinical environment, and then also you're doing your own consulting um, within your own business. Is that is that right? It's kind of like all the same sort of thing. So it's basically okay. individual consulting with patients. And we either do like face-to-face in a private practice or we do online on an online kind of private practice. But it's all the same. You know, we work with the individual one-on-one. We do a very comprehensive assessment to find out like, you know, what is their medical history? What medications are they taking? What supplements are they taking? What are their health goals? And can we help them refine and improve their health goals and make them more smart, I guess? Um, what do their blood tests say? What is their dieting history? We want to find out so much detail. And that's why we spend an hour, sometimes even longer with our patients, because we need all of that detail to then work out what is this person's nutritional diagnoses? Like what are the priorities here that we need to focus on? Um, and look, that's how dietitians are trained to work really. But I think a lot of dietitians kind of get lost in the dogma of things and they kind of just like maybe don't give themselves enough time to work with patients and really personalize it like we do. But every clinic I've worked at, I've made it a non-negotiable thing that we need an hour. We need an hour with our patients. Um, and it's been great working with Dr. Pran Yoganathan at the Center for Gastrointestinal Health because he totally just gets it. Like he's so nutrition focused, which is so rare for a gastroenterologist. And like, he really gets that, you know, we need that time with patients and he's like fully supported us with that. And we've seen such amazing results working as a multidisciplinary team. Like we've helped people reverse their diabetes. We've helped people put inflammatory bowel disease into remission without medications. Like it's so amazing what you can achieve with nutrition. So you, have, you get somebody come in, you do this whole big discovery session for like an hour to find out, you know, where they're deficient in nutrients and what they've been eating and all that sort of thing. And then this is it kind of like an education process. So you start trying to explain to them how, how they could be eating better. Can you kind of step me through how some of those conversations might go? Yeah. Yeah, there's so much education when it comes to diet. Um, and I think that's what separates, well, I don't think I know that's probably what separates dietitians from just like, um, you know, your personal trainer or something like that. Like your personal trainer can give you a meal plan and don't get me wrong. Like it can be a great meal plan and it can work. Um, they can give you the how, right. But a dietitian can really go into depth of the why, like, why are you making this change? How, you know, how does your body work? And why does that, you know, relate to nutrition and so on? So, yeah, we leave a big chunk in our consultations for education. So we explain like diet disease relationships. Okay. And it's funny as well, like how many people don't know about the condition they're diagnosed with. Mm. So like, you know, people rattle off their medical conditions to us. Like I've got type two diabetes, I've got PCOS, like this, that, whatever. And then we just say to them, so do you know what PCOS is or do you know what type 2 diabetes is? And we're not trying to be like rude or condescending, but a lot of the times they're like, "Um, no, no one's ever explained that to me. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And so it's so nice for us to explain that to patients, like what their actual condition means and what it looks like. Because even before we get to the diet recommendations, people start figuring it out on their own. Like when we explain diabetes to people and we just simply tell them, you know, it's an excess of glucose, which is basically sugar in your blood. And we need to get that down. And they're like, oh, okay. So sugar's in carbohydrates and sugar's in processed foods. Like I need to eat less of that. And it's like, from from my experience, when you talk to people and you explain that sugar is in all carbohydrates or the carbohydrates are a sugar, which I've laid out. Um, most people don't realize that so like you know those healthy carbs that you're getting in like a loaf of bread that's sugar and if you've got type 2 diabetes and you've got too much glucose in your system that's that's an issue right yeah 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you say to people, um, like usually a lot of people coming in to see us, like they're very motivated and it's not like they're not trying, you know, they're definitely trying, but they've been given the wrong advice. So as you're alluding to, like people with diabetes, they basically get told to eat low glycemic carbohydrates. So carbohydrates that are going to kind of slow the blood sugar rise and make it go for a little bit longer as opposed to a rapid blood sugar rise. But at the end of the day, it's still a blood sugar rise. And our body only tolerates a very small amount of sugar at once. And when you have type 2 diabetes and you essentially cannot metabolize carbohydrates effectively, it's like, well, what if we actually reduce the total load of carbs instead of just swapping high GI carbs for low GI carbs? What if we just cut back all of the carbs? And like so many people think that's really obvious when you explain it to them. And then they sometimes have this moment of realization where they're like, well, why hasn't anyone told me this before? And I guess that's why I'm doing my PhD, because I want to not just create new research for type 1 diabetes, but in type 2 diabetes, I want to translate that research into practice more. So that was like my first PhD project was to do that. And then my subsequent PhD projects was to use the research in type 2 and translate that into type 1. Yeah, I love it. I was I was at the airport the other day and I was like just walking through the magazine and there was this magazine called like Diabetes Australia or something. And on the front cover, I shit you not, is like this giant chocolate cake and it says like low GI chocolate cake. And it's just like you guys are you guys are entirely missing the point. Like that is just so unsatiating, so processed. You could probably eat five of those cakes. And yeah, you just you wouldn't even feel full. You just gorge yourself. Blood sugar would be through the roof. It's um, I know. It's just so when bad. You, um, and what a lot of people don't realize, because the GI, like the glycemic index, has been given so much weighting. Like people think it's the best thing ever, but the GI index is only applied to carbohydrate-based foods. And so, like people don't realize that fat, healthy fats, and like, well, mainly fat, has a GI of basically zero, right? But you don't get told that, you know, because GI is just given to carbohydrate-based foods. So when people are, they've got diabetes and they're getting the standard education, they're like, okay, which one is like the best of the worst? That's what the GI is. What is the the worst? (laughs) That's that's the diabetes-friendly chocolate cake, right? It's it's, it's just retarded. So Jess, you get your... Yeah, typical Australian in there, um, and they say, you know, I'm eating really healthy. I eat a Mediterranean diet. I have pasta five times a week. I have a sandwich for bread every day, um, and I'm avoiding all red meat. How does the, uh, how do you kind of get these people to trigger that that ain't good for you? Yeah. Well, it's relatively easy when people are coming in with their health all over the place. Because (laughs) sometimes no one's laid this out for them, but you can just sort of say, okay, look at what you're eating and look at what your health markers are doing. Do you actually think what you're doing now is working for you? And I know that sounds like obvious, but it's not actually obvious to a lot of people because they haven't actually sat down and really truly reflected how what they're doing is impacting their health markers because we are not told to make an association between what we eat and our health and our vitality. Like no one educates us on that. Total madness, complete madness. Yeah, yeah. And so like when people kind of make that realisation and they're like, she's right, I've got diabetes, I've been listening to my doctor, I've been doing everything I've been told, And my diabetes is getting worse. So I need to do something different. And that's the first step when they realize that what they're doing isn't working and they need to do something different. And that's the rationale for us too, because like, we're not saying a low fat, high carb diet doesn't work. Like for some people it does, but the people we're seeing that are coming to us, they've been doing it and it's definitely not working. So they need to try something else And we know that a low carb, high fat diet is the most effective for type two diabetes management. And just in our clinic alone, like we've seen a lot of benefits. One of the main benefits is you don't actually have to calorie restrict when you're doing a lower carb, high fat diet. 
And so it's actually a lot more sustainable for people because like they have been diligently portion controlling everything and going hungry all the time and pushing through tiredness. Like they think that's normal and that's mm. just their life now, you know? And so when we say to them, no, 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 you don't have to do that. There's no max portion of these foods. Go eat, enjoy. It's kind of like, really? It's like a weight off their chest. And so that's another really big positive for people in terms of trying a different approach because like there's, there's so many wins, I guess, associated with that. Um, but look, the other thing I do as well for people who, especially with the red meat thing, and when people are just... Um, they kind of say it to me like, oh, yeah, I don't eat red meat. No, 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 I wouldn't touch that. Yeah, As they're really I'm, proud of it. Yeah, they're really proud of it. Don't eat red meat. I don't eat salt. I only have two eggs. And we then just say to them, well, why? Why don't you eat red meat? And again, they're like, oh, I don't know. Because well, I, I can imagine they would say, oh, it's inflammatory. There's like a misconception that somehow red meat is inflammatory. I mean, grains and um, vegetables in my experience, are way more inflammatory than, you know, a nice clean steak. Yeah, well, people just know that, well, they think that red meat's bad. So they're just like, oh, I know it's bad. Like my doctor said it's bad or someone said it's bad. And then I say, okay, well, did they explain why it's bad? You know, because you need to drill into the why because when people can't actually explain what they're doing, then it's much easier to come in and give them an explanation that makes sense and then they are like, wow, that's really logical. You know, I'm going to go and do that, right? Um, because like sometimes people do have like good explanations for dietary things that they're doing. And if that's working for them, that's cool. But if they're eating something and they have no idea why, or if they're avoiding something and they don't know why, and I can educate them and I can say, well, based on your health outcomes, I'm not sure if this is the right thing for you. And I think you need to try something different because X, Y, Z. And so like with red meat, a lot of people, especially at the Centre for Gastrointestinal Health, a lot of people think it either causes heart disease or bowel cancer. And so we sometimes will talk them science. So there are some scientific studies that have linked red meat to bowel cancer or heart disease or diabetes. But they are very large observational epidemiological studies which do not prove causation. So they are simply just correlations. And then the correlations that these studies do make are extremely weak. So it's not like the correlation between smoking and lung cancer, like that's a definite correlation. Um, but the correlation between like red meat and some of these health conditions, it's so weak. And then when researchers have come along and tried to do randomized controlled trials to prove that correlation, they have been unsuccessful. So the recommendation to reduce your intake of red meat based on it increases your risk of cancer or heart disease, that is not based on science. Like that is not an evidence-based recommendation. So it is not necessarily something we give to patients. Nice, that's a good explanation. What, what about uh, all the people coming in saying they're avoiding saturated fat? and you know, expecting a pat on the back for that. Yeah, well, it's the same explanation really, because it's the yeah. same issue with the research studies. Um, but another thing that we say with saturated fat, um, particularly people who like really are gonna benefit from a low carb diet, right? So this is kind of the people I'm talking about. Mm. So if you do go on a low carb diet, what you're doing is you're taking away your body's main energy source because carbohydrates, if your diet's high in carbohydrates, that's the fuel your body is running on. You're giving it carbs. It's using sugar for energy. Like that's how your body is running. So if you suddenly lower the carbs, what fuel are you going to use? Because our body, like we use so much energy every single day and people don't realize this. Even if you're just lying in a bed flat and your eyes are closed, you can be burning around 1500 calories a day. Yeah. That's like three solid meals that your body needs just to be alive. And so if you take away the carbs and you stay with the low fat and you've just got protein, that's essentially a starvation diet. And you can get very, very sick, very, very ill. You're going to feel terrible. And then you're going to be like, this diet sucks. I can't do it. I'm going back to what I was doing before. Okay. Rabbit starvation. Exactly. Yes. 
So your body needs energy, your body needs fuel. So you need healthy fats for that. And then when you say the word healthy fat, people are like, oh yeah, margarine and avocados and nuts and things like that. And it's like, well, yeah, of course. So monounsaturated fat is a healthy fat. But if you look at the fat composition in real whole foods like red meat or eggs, you'll find that the balance of monounsaturated fat and saturated fat is very much even. So it's not like these foods are just pure saturated fats. They're giving you just as much, if not more, monounsaturated fat. And so we can see that in nature when we go for minimally processed foods, there is saturated fat there, but there is a nice balance of all the essential fats are neat, we need. And your body's actually going to use a lot of that saturated fat for energy. It's going to burn it. It's not just going to sit in your bloodstream and hang out there and clog your arteries like everybody thinks. Because if you lower your carbs, you give your body an opportunity to burn the fat. Yeah, that's very key. Uh, and, you know, if, if people are motivated to lose body fat as well, it's like, hey, cut the carbs, start eating a bit more fat, start running on fat. And then when you run out of the fat that you put in your mouth, you'll then be able to tap into the fat on your body. That's how you lose body fat. Um, exactly. And understanding that process, which we're not taught, we're taught you lose fat by not eating fat and then smashing yourself on the treadmill. Um, you know, I think that can be, I imagine that would be a big breakthrough for people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have so many clients coming to us on these like, really low calorie diets like sometimes 800 torture. It is total day. torture yeah and they're going to the gym as well and like going on the treadmill as you say and like when you ask them like how do you really feel you know they're breaking down in tears because they feel terrible but they're trying to do what they've been told and they're sitting here like 40 kilos overweight and their weight isn't budging and they're like how why you know, and a standard dietitian or nutritionist or personal trainer would just think they're lying. Mm. But you can see in these people's oh, eyes, yeah. they are not lying. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, like it's sort of a fundamental truth is that people are trying to be healthy, um, but they're doing the wrong thing. They got the wrong information. And that's why it's so brilliant what you and Dr. Pan and others are doing. It's, it's really powerful. Um, Jess, I want to flip over and talk a little bit more about you. What's your current philosophy around food and how do you like to eat to nourish yourself? I pretty much do for myself what I do for my patients. And I think the most important thing is I'm constantly reassessing how I feel. So it's like just day-to-day -day signs and signals. Like what are my energy levels like? What is my mood like? What is my cognitive health like? You know, how much can I concentrate? Things like that. And those are kind of like indicators for me and my digestion and things like that. They're sort of indicators to me as to how well I'm going like with my diet. Am I giving my body the things that it needs? Because one thing that I've learned just personally, but also working with patients is that your nutritional needs are going to change over the course of your life. And sometimes they change over the course of a single year. Sometimes they change over the course of a single month. Mm -hmm. So no one is ever going to get to a point where they're just like, that's it. I found the right diet. I'm just eating this every day for the rest of my life. I don't need to change it. I've got this and I'm going to feel great. No, that's not going to happen. At some point, you're not going to feel good anymore and you need to start reevaluating and reassessing. And one of the most simple examples of that is like when people age, they need more protein, um, but no one really thinks about that. No one really tells you that. So you just think you need to eat the same thing every day for the rest of your life. Yeah, you definitely need more protein as you age. And that's why we have so much sarcopenia and people losing muscle as they get older and getting more insulin resistant. They're just not meeting their protein needs. And so for myself, I guess I just constantly tweak and reevaluate, but I kind of use the same sort of structure as I do for my patients where I sort of have five to six nutritional priorities that I focus on at a time. And then I reevaluate because if you are trying to focus on everything at once, like you're reading all these things online and it's like, someone said I need to take magnesium and someone said I need to eat red meat 10 times a week. And someone said this and someone said that 
then you're just going to burn yourself out and you're not going to be able to do anything because you're giving yourself too many strategies to focus on. Mm -hmm. So as I said, yeah, I'll just focus on maybe five nutritional priorities. So one thing I'm always focusing on is, am I getting enough protein? So am I having protein with every single meal? Am I getting enough to fuel my, like what I'm doing in the day? Like, am I doing more working out? Am I doing less working out? And am I always stressed? Are we talking chickpeas or meat? <laughs> so <laughs> when I was younger, I, I definitely used to like be very plant-based and I used to think like vegetarian proteins are the best. You know, I was vegetarian for a while, but now that I know so much about nutrition and I've actually looked at the nutrient content of all these different foods there's no denying it that animal proteins are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. Like that's not debatable. So if you are going to try and improve your nutritional intake, you have to include animal proteins. And that's something I have been constantly focusing on for myself. And I've actually found that over the years, like increasing that more and more and more has driven me closer and closer to better health. And it's the same thing that I see for my patients. But as I said, you never get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm doing this now and that's done. No, you need to constantly reevaluate and make changes. Yeah, I like that. Like, you know, there's, it's all a constant learning. You, you're never going to get it perfectly right, I don't think. Um, and even like week to week, I noticed that, you know, one week I might be exercising more than another or I might be working really hard and not sleeping properly and you do start to notice that um, your body needs maybe a different type of fuel or often it's like more or less fuel. Um, I'm wondering if, if you can kind of help me and the others with some sort of like trigger points for how you might be feeling and then think about like how you'd alter your nutrition for based on that trigger point. Mm. Does that question kind of make sense? Yeah, I love that question. And I think that's so good because what you're really saying is like, how can we tune into our body signals and then figure out what nutrient or food our body needs? And this is exactly what we do in practice. We teach people to evaluate what their body is trying to tell them. Because, you know, we can use all these calculations and we can look into the research to kind of like estimate what people need but your body knows what you need and everybody is so unique. So I guess like the really high level example that people always forget about is if you're low in energy, you might need more energy. <laughs> it's a really obvious simple Groundbreaking. one. Pardon? Groundbreaking. Yeah, groundbreaking, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but again, like people forget the, the underlying reason that we eat food is to get energy, to give us energy. And that's why I'm so against these like low calorie, low fat diets, because you're just so severely restricting energy that the body starts down regulating its energy output, which basically means your body burns less energy every day. And you as an individual have less energy to use which means you're on the couch having naps in the afternoon. You're fear feeling irritable and anxious because your brain is literally running out of fuel and your body is in fight or flight. It's in survival. So it literally holds on to stored energy. And anytime you eat something, it's storing it all away. It's not even letting you use it. And you're wondering why you're not moving closer to your goals and why you're feeling so awful. And so just a simple thing, like if your energy is low, asking yourself the question, am I actually eating enough? And I, am I also giving myself the energy that I wish to burn? Because that's the other thing. Our body will burn either glucose or fat. And we have a choice and we can tell our body what fuel we want to burn. Some people want to burn glucose and that's totally fine. Especially some athletes that are doing, you know, short intensity exercise and they want to use quick acting fuel, which is glucose. No problem. So put carbohydrates in your tank. But most people want to burn fat and our bodies are designed to burn fat. So if you need more energy and you're restricting fats, then maybe you need to dial up the energy in your diet from healthy sources of fat 
We're not talking about going out and getting deep fried food like, oh, I just said I need more energy. I'm going to KFC. That's not, not what I mean. We're talking about energy your body can actually use and is designed to use. So that would be like my biggest example, but I can give you more if you want. Yeah, so I like that. So the example is feeling low and flat on energy, which everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what would be a go-to meal that's high in healthy fat? So even just like a simple, because like people sometimes will say like when they wake up in the morning, like they just feel flat from the beginning. Like they wake up, they're flat. And so just starting with breakfast, like you don't have to overhaul your diet. You can just start with breakfast. So an easy swap is like swapping out like the cereal and the bread and moving to like an egg-based breakfast or a cooked breakfast. Maybe have some avocado on the side, maybe have a couple of like, you know, beef sausages or something like that. Give yourself some good quality proteins and healthy fats from minimally processed foods. And what you'll find is your energy levels go up for the whole day and your hunger isn't as bad. So you don't need to snack multiple times of the day to like pick yourself up. You've got more of this steady, stable energy. Life changing. It, it literally is. Like seriously life-changing yeah. i remember the days where i used to make a banana smoothie for breakfast and as soon as i had finished the smoothie i was like ravenous like all i could think about was food yeah. and i would then just have like an apple and then i'd be ravenous and then i would just have some nuts and i'd be ravenous like you need to have proper meals with a proper amount of energy and protein 100 percent. yeah that's sort of like steak and eggs i always come back to that so if you have steak and eggs, you will feel like there's no bloating, consistent energy, it tastes delicious, you know, you can run, you can run all day. Um, you can have one meal a day if you want, just steak and eggs. But yeah, bacon and eggs and something that's that whole food, healthy fat, lots of protein. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what people want to eat. They oh, just like yeah they think they need to eat the cereal or the grains or the bread because they think that's right but like if you said to them forget about all the nutritional dogma forget about all the recommendations you've been told in the past what do you actually want for breakfast and you'll find it's exactly what you said like steak and eggs or eggs and bacon or i want an omelet with cheese you know yeah. like people want that food mm. it's tricky though because then you put like croissants in front of somebody at breakfast with like you know heaps of honey or something sweet and you know it is very easy to go to town on those like highly appetizing nutrient poor foods um but yeah i think it's a bit of for me I, I, what i've found with people is it's a bit of a rolling ball it's like once you get them onto that kind of like high fat high protein breakfast and they realize how they feel after it then the body starts to crave it more and the mind gets on board and then you start to make really big strides and I actually start to realize how you feel after you eat food because you know I, I think most, most people have absolutely no idea how a different meal will make them feel that's so true because it's like yes the croissant with honey and butter is going to like look delicious and mm -hmm. like when you're eating it you feel like you're on top of the world but tune in to what happens 30 minutes later or an hour later. Like, do you feel bloated? Is your stomach in pain? Are you starving, hungry? Are you falling asleep at work? Are you needing your coffee? Are you needing your morning tea? Like, what is your body trying to say? And does it actually really feel good with that breakfast? And most of the time people, when they tune into it, they realize, no, it doesn't. The idea of that breakfast is like more than how it actually makes you feel after totally that's a really good way to put it you've uh, you've clearly dealt with hundreds of people who come in with that that kind of attitude um, yeah yeah I like and that. like i guess the other thing to say there just quickly as well is when people especially people with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance their body is literally dependent on glucose and so like, because when your insulin levels are really, really high, your body cannot access fat. Your body cannot see any stored fat. It cannot use it for energy. Insulin is like a switch that switches off fat burning. So if you're waking up in the morning and you've got really bad insulin resistance and your insulin's really high, the only fuel your body knows how to burn is glucose. So it is going to drive you towards high carb, high sugar foods as a survival instinct, right? Because it cannot burn fat at that point.
But if you start putting fat into the body in the absence of carbohydrate, your body starts to see the fat coming in and going, ah, we can use that. And it's like what you said before, when you start giving your body that energy from fat, eventually it starts figuring out how to use its own stored body fat. That's I honestly think that's like the secret to understanding nutrition right there. So just to put it in my very simple layman's terms, it's like, you know, if, if you keep feeding yourself carbohydrate, your body is just running off glucose and that's the only thing it needs to, it knows how to run on. And your body will naturally crave those carbohydrate, sugary foods. You'll feel good initially. But if you make the change, and it is, from my experience, you, you do kind of have to force the change a little bit because when you when your body goes from, a, from using glucose for energy to then using fat, like, you know, say somebody who tries a carnivore diet for the first time, it's a real shock to the system and you feel flat, you get keto flu. But eventually your body will adapt uh, and then you'll start to be able to use fat for energy uh, and your body will crave it. You can use the fat that you put in your body and then when you run out of that, you can start tapping into fat storage on your body, which actually feels awesome. And for me, that's kind of feels like ketosis and you just feel like it's this consistent energy that will run forever and you're calm and you can get things done, you're productive. Um, and when you get to that kind of level, it's like entering the matrix which just helping everybody get to when they come and, you know, turn up with type 2 diabetes and leave, and then leave healthy. Um, it's totally life-changing. Absolutely. Spot on. All right. I hope that people will understand your more technical version and my more entering the matrix version. Um, no, it's good. It's good to have it explained in two different ways. Yeah. People need to hear it over and over again because we're challenging their belief system and we're challenging the habits they've been following for the last 20, 30, 40 years. Absolutely. Um, so Jess, uh, where can people find you? So people can find me on Instagram. So Jessica Turton underscore dietitian or on my website, which is www.ellipshealth.com.au. Um, and I'm also on Facebook. If you just type in Jessica Turton Dietitian, I'm sure you'll find me that way. Yeah. And you've got a podcast as well, don't you? Yeah. My, um, my friend and I have recently started a podcast called Vibe with Tribe. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> no worries. I've listened to, I've listened to a couple of episodes the last couple of days. Did so. you? Great. Yeah. Well, it's actually a podcast dedicated to helping people improve their relationship with food. So there's a lot of educational stuff on there, but it's really for those people who want to make this like a lifestyle change. You know, they don't want to go on a diet again. They want to, you know, change their life. Right. Yeah, which I think is very beneficial. Most people should want that. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right, Jess. Well, that was a really helpful chat and we'll definitely speak again in the future. But thank you very much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Until next time.